Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to a three news digital exclusive. I am Ben Axelrod. Joining me is Jay Crawford. Um, not as much going on in the sports world as Jay and I are used to bantering about, but uh, lots of MLB news over the course of the last few weeks, and especially over the course of uh, this week. Um, and the latest news is MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred telling ESPN's Mike Greenberg on Monday during a Back to Sports special. Uh, that he is no longer 100% certain that the 2020 MLB season is going to happen. Uh, he had previously said that, uh, previously guaranteed that the MLB season would happen in some form. But um, here we are. It is, uh, we are officially past the midway point of June. The players and the owners are still negotiating. And uh, now we have the first indication from the uh, owners that, that a season might not be happening. Uh, Jay, if, if anybody follows you on social media, they know you've been following this closely and uh, been been pretty passionate about it. Uh, what have been some of your takeaways from this uh, these negotiations between the players and the owners? In typical baseball fashion, they are screwing the whole thing up. And I, it's my strong belief at this point that we are more likely to not have a season than we are to have a season, which is quite a juxtaposition from where Manfred said we were just a week ago. That's why you don't unequivocally put a 100% guarantee on anything. And particularly when you are the single loudest voice in the sport. Um, there's plenty of blame to go around. We can get into that. I think the owners are to blame for a lot of this. And I think the players share some of the blame as well. But to the fan, it doesn't matter. The only thing for the fan is that if there's no season, there's no season. And if there's one sport in America that can ill afford losing an entire season, particularly because of labor strife, at this very particular time in our nation's history, it's baseball. And I'm afraid we're about to see what happens if that, uh, if that comes to fruition. Yeah. And, and just to give some backdrop and, and backstory on all of this, um, obviously the, the 2020 MLB season delayed indefinitely back in March due to the coronavirus pandemic. Back then, the players and the owners, they actually came to an agreement uh, that said that the MLB could set the season so long as they played the, paid the players their full prorated salaries. Um, now, the negotiations now, though, those seem to be the two big sticking points is how long is this season going to be? And the owners want the players to take a cut from those prorated salaries because they're not going to have fans in the stands if they do play. Um, and to me, that's something that stood out to me is because that's they have this agreement in place going back to March is why did they come to an agreement even back in March under the assumption that the fans were going to be in the stands when, when back then you think of how much we've learned about the coronavirus and, and about mass gatherings since then. Why did they even come to that agreement back in March? Well, Ben, if you're looking for where the train came off the tracks, that was it the owners were foolish to come to that agreement because at that point we had no idea when it would be safe to put mass gatherings of people in the stadiums. What we did know at that time was that mass gatherings were being limited to 10 or fewer. So why the owners would put their names to a contract agreeing to pay the players their full salaries on a prorated basis. That was nonsense. It was their mistake. And where we are now, is a direct result of the owner's miscalculation that we that it would be safe to put fans back in stadiums. And now you've got all these owners saying, oh, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We didn't know then. Well, that's on you. That, you know, it's caveat emptor. So let the buyer beware. And in this particular case, what they were buying was the notion that we would be able to put fans in stadiums when baseball resumed. Now, from a player standpoint, I, what I wish they would as a group come to realize is that 40 million Americans are out of work, 40 million. So owners now want to make good on their mistake. And I understand the players saying, no, we're going to hold you to it. I get that. But we know where the owners look bad by making this agreement. The players been taken on the chin at a time where they're saying to the rest of America who badly needs their game for a distraction, oh, no, we're not going to go back to work for less money. We're not going to do that because they told us they'd pay us everything. How many contracts have been voided by forced majeure because it's, it's, it's of no one's doing? It's, it's, it's just the way things played out. 
So the owners look bad for making that agreement. The players look bad for not saying in good faith, we understand your mistake. We're willing to make some concessions and meet in the middle. And it seems to me the players have been able, have been willing, more willing to give than the owners. And now comes word that there's a group of six or eight owners that are just fine without playing the season. Ben, let me ask you, can you guess which six or eight owners those are? I, I could put together a pretty strong pool. Let me throw my pool out to you, and you can agree or disagree. Okay. I think my pool would be our Cleveland Indians, the Detroit Tigers, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Kansas City Royals, the Milwaukee Brewers, the Cincinnati Reds, maybe the Florida Marlins, small market teams that don't have large local TV deals in place that they can lean on to play their payers, their players' salaries. So, and that's just my theory. I have no inside information, but I can put together which six or eight stand to lose the most if we have a season. So if you have a group of owners that is that large, that's willing to rip the season up and say, nope, we're not going to do this, I don't see how we ever get to a season. I really don't. And by the way, this is an unintended consequence of baseball's uneven playing field, where the geographical advantage of being a New York team or a Boston team or an LA team or a team in a large metropolitan area gives you such an inherent advantage over the smaller market teams simply because your TV deal can be worth so much more money. So there are differences within the union side. There's clear factions now. And I think the players are unified. So that I, in my mind, that gives the players the upper hand. But if you've got a group of six or eight owners that are willing to say we're good with no season, I don't think you're going to get a season. No, oh, I, I totally agree. And, and I think, you know, you look at the way these negotiations have gone. Uh, the owners, in, in some form or fashion, if there is a season or not, they're going to take this on the chin. There, there's going to be teams losing money uh, without fans in the stands. The reported figure is 40% of revenue comes from fans in the stands, from, from tickets and merchandise and, and concessions. Um, I don't know how accurate that figure is, but, but even if it's in, let's say it's in the, the 25 to 30 percent range. That, that's still a significant uh, amount of revenue that the uh, owners would be losing out on. Um, you know, one, one term we've heard, and ironically, we, we've heard it from both sides over the course of the last two days, is bad faith. That the other side is uh, negotiating in bad faith. I think both sides are negotiating in bad faith. I, I think if you look I, at the owners' proposals, they're basically making the same proposals, just dressing them up differently, whether it's how many games we're going to play or, or how, how much they're going to cut the salaries. And then for the players, the players clearly have the ace in the hole in all of this, and that is the March agreement for the prorated salaries. And I think what we saw this weekend with the players turning down the proposal, and uh, you saw it with Trevor Bauer's tweet, you actually saw it, I thought, with Francisco Lindor's tweet, is the players saying, hey, set the season and pay us our prorated salaries. And they know by doing it at this point in the middle of June, they can force the owners into – either looking bad by, by um, not doing it or, or setting a schedule of 50 games when at this point they could still play 70 or by further delaying the negotiations, which, which is what we're seeing. I think we're seeing both sides negotiate this in, in poor faith, in bad faith. And I think that has a lot to do with just the relationship between these two sides. Uh, we're, talk we're, we're talking about negotiating for the start of the 2020 season, but the reality is – these two sides have issues that go all the way back to, to really the start of free agency, uh, to, to the 1994 strike, all the way through. Uh, these are just, for whatever reason, this has been the most tenuous relationship between uh, a league and its players that, that we've seen in sports. And, and the way we're playing it out is they appear to be the one sport that, that doesn't have a strong path back for a 2020 season. I couldn't agree more. It's all based on a history of mistrust. And my view is the, the reported percentage is 40%, but the owners won't open their books. So what do you think that means? That means it's not 40%. And, and that leaves the players to wonder, well, what is it? And I've heard a lot of capitalists say, well, hey, wait, this is an ownership versus employee relationship. Walmart doesn't have to open its books if it doesn't want to to its employees. But here's the difference. Major League Baseball is built on a skill set that so few people possess. And that, and you can just look at the numbers. The AAA level to Major League level, the difference in skill set is minuscule. 
but the the fans don't support the AAA level like they do the major league level because it's not the highest form. So the relationship between owners and players needs to be more symbiotic. What it needs to happen here, the owners need to, in good faith, open their books, show the players what their finances are. That eliminates all the mistrust and all the decades of no trust between the two sides. Once the players then get to look at the books, then they can come up to an agreement for what's the fair split between ownership and player. And I don't know what that is, but I will say this. If Walmart's having a bad year, they don't close 250 stores to make it to, to, to balance the books and make sure that no store owners lose, you know, no store operators are losing money. They rely on the, on the 2,500 stores that are doing extremely well to support the 500 that aren't because it's one business in totality. So Major League Baseball doesn't have that structure. They have revenue share on the national TV money, which is the bulk of its money but there's still too big a disparity between small and large franchises. So large franchises aren't willing to help support the small franchises during times of trouble. And this is a time of trouble. So you've got the Cleveland's, Detroit's, Kansas City's, the teams with bad TV deals saying, we can't possibly turn a profit this year. And the big teams are saying, we can make this work. Well, they have to figure that out inside their own offices. They have to come to an agreement for how the large markets are going to help support the small markets because you're only as strong as your weakest franchise. And if a Cleveland or an Oakland or a Kansas City can't make payments and has to suddenly start defaulting on business loans, that's a look, bad look on the whole league. So two things need to happen. Open your books to the players union and be transparent and fair and come up with whatever that fair share is for the player's pool. What you do when you come up with that number is, you let's say it's gonna be a 51-49 split between owner's money and player's money. If that's what it, it ends up being, you take the 49% that you're gonna to pay to the players and you divide it by 30, and that's your salary cap. That's it, you can't exceed it. Then you know that each team will be playing, as they are in the NFL, on an even playing field. It gives Oakland, Kansas, Kansas City, Cleveland, Detroit, Pittsburgh, just as good a chance as being dominant like the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Angels, the Cubs, and all of the big market teams. Because if you have this group of powerful big market teams and weak small market teams, you have a weak league. You have a league where you're not going to have complete interest in 30 markets. You look at the NFL, they have major interest in all 32 markets because the playing field is even. I, I think another, you know, another complicated part about all this too is whatever agreement they make could extend it to next season. Who knows what it's going to look like as far as fans coming back to sporting events. And also, I believe the CBA is up uh, between the two sides after 2021. So uh, this kind of sets the table for, for what's already been uh, a messy negotiation between the two sides. Uh, shifting gears real quickly before we get out of here. Uh, I was watching Long Gone Summer on, on Sunday, the ESPN documentary about Mark McGuire and, and Sammy Sosa. And that home run chase of 1998, a big backdrop of it was the 1994 strike that, that ultimately led to them not playing the World Series and how really it took the 1998 home run chase to, to bring fans back uh, and, and to really lead to another surge in popularity. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Jay. I don't think we're going to see another home run chase uh, anytime soon. Uh, so if they don't get back on the field, if, if this is something that, that wipes out the entirety of the 2020 season and, and potentially part of the 2021 season as well, uh, what sort of damage does this do for baseball as a whole? When beaches erode, Ben, they never rebuild the coastline. They never reclaim that erosion. And that's the analogy I'll, I'll use with Major League Baseball and its fan base. They are doing irreparable and irreversible harm to the long-term health of their game if they take away our season at a time when we desperately need any kind of sports distraction we can get. And we all know in the summer months that the only distraction, once the NBA playoffs are gone, is baseball. But this year, that void will be filled by what? The NBA playoffs, which will go well into the summer. And you know what that will be easier on for fans? to think about baseball 
So take us out of your mind. Take us off the front of your mind for one minute, baseball, and the void will be filled by something else. And you're losing an entire generation of young people if you don't expose them to your game. And they're stealing the opportunity to regain some of its dying fan base. Ben, the numbers on baseball's average fan are frightening. You and I are well below the average, the, the, where, where the heart of MLB's fan base currently resides. It's, it's 55 plus. So if you're not willing to rebuild that with younger generations, you're going to lose those fans forever. The game, in my view, has never been in poorer hands than it is right now. And for evidence of that, I will offer not just this labor strife, but the baseball internal investigation of, the, of a major cheating scandal, major, Ben, a cheating scandal so large that it essentially awarded the World Series championships to the two teams that systematically cheated over the last two years. Major League Baseball has chosen to look the other way and dole out zero punishments to the players that cheated, definitely swung baseball games, decided championships, and put money in their pockets, and none of them are getting punished. The, the way Major League Baseball handled that will prove to be one of the cornerstones of the movement that we see ahead of us of a mass exodus of fans. Fans I talk to are done. And by the way, the fact that a New York judge had to rule Friday that the letter Major League Baseball sent to the New York Yankees on its investigation of, it, of their sign-stealing seal, scandal, the Yankees and Major League Baseball want desperately for that letter to remain private. The judge said, no, you know what? We should see it. We pay for the tickets. We want to know that what we're looking at is real. The Yankees, in their defense of sharing the letter publicly, was public exposure of this letter would do irreparable damage to the reputation of the New York Yankees. What does that tell you the letter said? The letter said unequivocally that the Major League Baseball caught them red-handed cheating against my team to defeat my team in the playoffs, as the Astros also did the next year. And Major League Baseball is willing to sit by and let this happen, yet the man who has more base hits than anyone ever to play, who never cheated to win games, and there's no proof that he ever did anything within his games to lose a game intentionally because he had placed a bet. There's no proof he ever placed a bet for his team to lose. And yet he has a lifetime ban from the sport. This sport can't get out of its own way. And I believe they've never been in, in poorer hands than they are right now. Yeah, I, I think it would be pretty tough to argue otherwise. And um, let's end this, though. Let, let's try to end this, at least on as positive of a note as we can. I'd love that. Uh, a path back. This is what I see as a – I see two paths back for baseball this season. Uh, one, it would be just a, a, a ramroded 50-game season where MLB says, all right, we're playing 50 games, and it doesn't feel like much of a season, but – some baseball is, is better than no baseball, and we're going to pay the full prorated salaries. And I don't think that would be ideal, but, but I think that would be their idea, is some baseball is better than no baseball. And then two, I do think a part of what we've seen this week is a negotiating tactic by the owners uh, who, who clearly have lost some leverage with the players. I do think there is a path back for – and we're running out of time. I mean, this agreement would have to come in the next week, if not next few days – uh, for a 70-ish game season where the players agree to a cut, but it's not a cut that's as dependent on them finishing the World Series. It's a cut where the players are getting, you know, 80% of their prorated salaries guaranteed as opposed yeah. to 50% and then a bump after the playoffs. I think the first option is more likely. I, I think we'll probably see that one come to fruition. Um, I'm less confident in it than I was a few days ago, but, but those are the two paths I see back. What do you think? I, I agree with your 80%. I think all players should get 80% prorated. Uh, the owners are going to have to fall on their sword and say, we made a terrible mistake in judgment in signing that agreement. We regret it. We'll do whatever we can to honor it in some form or fashion. But here's the deal, Ben. What, what major corporation in the United States this year is going to operate at a profit? Right. Many, many will operate at, if not a single-digit deficit, some a double-digit deficit for the damage that's been done by the coronavirus. So why is it that baseball owners should be immune to that? When you own a business, 
you do so knowing that there will be many good years and there will be some less good years. Why does every year have to be a profitable year for the owners? I don't see that it, it's anywhere is it written that way. So take the good with the bad, pay your players fairly, admit that you made a huge mistake in March, and also admit going forward that before the 2021 negotiations and the, the future CBA negotiations, that you're going to sit down, open your books, and complete and open transparency. And from now on, the, the history of distrust between the two sides will be gone. I, I couldn't put it better myself, so we'll leave it there. Uh, that is going to do it for today's three news digital exclusive. He's Jay Crawford. I am Ben Axelrod. Uh, let us know what you think. Let us know on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, we'll be sharing this across all platforms. But that is going to do it for us. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks, Ben.